Hey guys, welcome to No Tux Allowed. Uh, I am a host called Josh. Uh, this is a podcast that's not necessarily about Linux because you know Tux is not allowed here. Uh, but we're not just about Linux. We're, we talk about general tech top tech topics today. But for I'm going to drop this warning here for you guys right now. There's a lot of Linux in this episode, and to help me nerd out here about the, about the wonderful uh, penguins that is called Tux, who is apparently not allowed here. I've got my big friend here, Big Pod. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, big Pod, I'm upset. I am Why? upset because uh, the, the, I have now spent a full week on Ubuntu, and as soon as we're done recording this, I am nuking this system. Why? Okay. So... Uh, I'm trying to uh, make use <clears throat> of automatic suspend in the GNOME power settings. You know, try to save a little bit of power on the electric bill. You know, don't no need to be running all the computers turned on 24-7 all, all the time. And uh, for some reason, when it goes into suspend, I think System D itself is, is uh, freezing and holding the entire system. And it <laughs> does this on the... And uh, it does this on the GNOME uh, lock lock session, where uh, GNOME locks, and then it's supposed to spend five minutes after that, where, for some reason, it turns my screens back on via the DPMS call, and it just stays there with my screens turned on. Now, of course, my bed is right here behind me, and uh, this is happening in the middle of the night, so I get, I'm getting woken up by this. Like, why is the computer? Why do the computer screens turn on? Yeah, that's course. that's an issue that I'm hearing a lot of people talk about. Like, in general, issue with uh, what it's called with suspend is general Linux issue. Yeah. So, uh, and it was work. I had this working on uh, my previous Gen two installation that I had, you know, previously, and I. I had that working and it worked perfectly fine for me when I was messing around with Fedora and it was working working perfectly fine when I was messing around with uh, Debian. So I think this this might be an Ubuntu specific thing. I haven't taken the time to actually really, really in-depth troubleshoot it and figure out like if it's some kind of canonical patch or anything like that. That's a bit beyond me. Uh, but I've also had some issues with a <clears throat> network manager just randomly stopping. <laughs> Where it would just drop all, it would just drop all communications. I would lose my IP addresses and everything. Yeah, and uh, I hope that's good. I hope that I have a working fit solution right now, where I'm currently just running a uh, system D timer to uh, restart Network Manager every five minutes, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that seems to be working. Uh, I've had some issues with the D- with the ZFS modules ca- causing the Linux kernel to panic. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then uh, the Ubuntu Software Center that that they ship with Ubuntu uh, does not see Debs, and not everything that that's that I want to install on Ubuntu is available as a snap. It'll it'll just show me snaps only. Well, like, it is, okay. After all, called Snap Store. Yeah, it, it's called the Snap Store. Yes. So and uh, store for snaps. Yeah, Nothing else. and. Uh, Bloat warning here, by by the way, guys. Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu the standard Ubuntu uh, desktop that, that you get from Ubuntu.com ships both the Snap Store and GNOME software. Who cares? Yeah, I I know. I know I shouldn't care, but I kind of care that there's two different software stores. Why can't we just have one? <laughs> <laughs> well, a part of the reason probably is they can actually more in depth control what goes onto the front page of Snap Store than what goes in front page of GNOME Software Store. Yeah, I, I guess that's true. Uh, and then I wanted to mess around with ZFS a little bit because, you know, I did install the system with the ZFS. We might as well take the time to actually learn something about this file system that, you know, I, I've i routinely hated on for the past few years because, you know, it's not natively inside my kernel. So uh, let's look at the ZFS snapshots and, and uh, let's see if we can get a system to boot off of a previous snapshot. Oh, wait. We're using Grub. Uh, okay, so what about ZFS replication? Oh, wait. We're, uh, my ZFS root, root system is installed in a Lux container. Oh. And like, oh, 
Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, I re- there's another podcast I listen to here called Two and a Half Admins, where there are a bunch of ZFS guys that talk about it. And they said in a previous episode of about how Ubuntu sets up ZFS wrong. And now I understand why they say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Okay. So, Big Pod, I think I'm going to go back to Debian. Really? Yeah, because, you know, we need an old and crusty, reliable system. So, Debian it is. Yeah, it's probably going to be Debian. Interesting. I did very briefly consider just booting booting up Alma Linux or CentOS Stream just for, just for the fun of it because they claim to support Intel Arc cards when, in fact, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> But Debian does support it. Uh, Debian has uh, the 6.7 kernel in their back porch repository. So uh, oh. they kind of do. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's been... Other than like the issues that I mentioned, which, you know, those are pretty big issues. Yeah. Uh, I've found like, the Ubuntu experience to be fine. Just saying this now, uh, lighted. It's it's very much. Uh, we're not even a, a full month into the LTS release, so uh, of course I I'm running into like these bugs that you know a lot of people probably are not going to be experiencing here later when yeah. later if they listen to this in in like the back feed. Uh, bear in mind at the date that, the time that we're recording this, it is currently uh, May twenty sixth, and I think this. And I think Ubuntu released uh, 24.04 literally 30 days ago. Yeah, I think so. Uh, the more yeah. important part uh, I think you, should, you shouldn't forget is that Ubuntu LTS, for those who upgrade from, let's say, 22.04 or 20.04, actually doesn't, uh, doesn't give an update notice until 24.04.1. So the yeah. first, first, uh, first update, big update release comes out. That is the first time update notices are given out, exactly because of that. Because yeah. there will be bugs and things to solve, and they want to solve them with without having to deal with a bunch of uh, angry customers who are upgrading. Because by yeah. 01, most most bugs get fixed. Uh, but yeah, uh, I did briefly consider uh, being the savage that I am, uh, and I did take a minute to look at NomoS because NomoS is is in fact a real distribution that you should probably never use. Yes. But uh, there's been a news update recently where uh, they're working on the, their installer again, work working on uh, you know some translation work, and like. It's been a hot minute since I since I uh, ran OS. Uh, let's see how much of a crap show it is. I haven't quite gotten to it yet. It is not meant for normal usage. No, it it's is not meant development for development OS. It's not meant for normal usage, but it does include GNOME software with Flatpak. Yeah. And it does update. And last I checked, they fixed Network Manager, so it actually has a network connection. And if I remember correctly, it's actually using OS3, not yeah, a standard, not a traditional yeah. model. And it's built off of OS3, so maybe yeah. we can make a daily driver. And as far as I remember, it wasn't OS3 written, first of all, for GNOME OS? I believe that it was. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and uh, it, it's always interesting... Uh, to uh, look at pro- projects that are like way way out in this space where they say you probably don't want to use this because you know that's when I actually want to use it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, have you ever looked? Have you ever uh, played around with Gnome OS before, Big Pod? No. Okay. Okay. I guess I'll have to. I guess we'll we'll have to have like a distro hacking episode where we we're messing around with uh, Gnome OS, <laughs> <laughs> and I can show everybody uh, what's so great about it because it is literally just Gnome. Yes, and the latest <laughs> gnome there is. Yep, 
it's always the latest known because it's whatever it's built off of whatever they can pull off the Git branch. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it's a little buggy. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I also got in a hot debate the other day. Why? Because uh, so- somebody told me that I'm not a Linux content creator because you can't create contact- content on Linux because it's absolutely horrible. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like, uh, this was actually a debate that I got in with somebody. Oh. So, uh, Big Pod, have you ever edited a video using a Linux native tool? Yes. Okay. Did you get the video edited? Yes. And it and it actually rendered and worked? Yes. Okay, because uh, that's what that's what this guy was saying that you specifically could not do. You can. There exist many tools for that. I don't know that you could use FFmpeg to do it if you really, really, really tried. Yeah. But now, honestly, uh, even let's, let's better tools to like graf- Caden Life. Yeah. Uh, let, let's keep it to graphical tools here because, you yes. know, I, I know that FFmpeg is a thing that works. And I also know that uh, Shot Cutter also, also is a thing that works. I think that there's even a suckless dev tool for uh, editing videos via the command line. Well, so, uh, <laughs> but... Now, now onto the serious tools. Caden Live works pretty well, but it isn't would, the greatest experience. Yeah, I would honestly think that if you're going to be messing around with video editing on Linux, Caden Live, of all the free and open source options, is probably the most feature rich. Yeah, that does not mean that it's stable or good. Just it, or, it has features. Yeah. yeah, it has features. You you can do cut transitions. It supports that MLT library, so it supports all yeah. the MLT plugins. So you you can mess around with it. And uh, if you've never done it, and if you kind of want to get into video editing, and uh, you're on a Linux system, try Caden Live. It's even available for Windows, but it, but yeah. Uh, and all my and from what I've heard, it works way better on Linux than it does Windows. Yeah. And if it's your first video editor, first NLE, you're gonna be just fine. If it's not your first, then sadly not that great of an experience. You're probably going to run into some issues. You're going to not be a fan of the experience. I'm going to say like that. Now, uh, back in the olden days of, you know, when I actually produced videos on Linux, uh, I used a video editor that was not Caden Live. I used OpenShot. Really? Yes. Uh, For the most part. Uh, Because, uh, I wanted a more simpler experience because I don't know if you watch my content, Big Pod, but I'm not doing anything fancy with the videos. Yeah. I mean, uh, now that I got Piper doing some of the editing for me, they they did get a little fancier. But when I was doing the editing, it was never really particularly fancy. <laughs> but well, Open Shot, just a video editor. You can do cuts in it. You can do some yeah. super basic transitions in it, and it kind of makes sense in how it works. So that's why I used it. <laughs> well, I am one of those that cannot deal with Caden Live or any of the open source tooling, but I I am too used to professional tooling. So professional tooling as in Adobe Premiere Pro. Yeah, yes. Premiere Pro. Okay, I'm too used to that. Yeah, and... professional YouTube tooling, not like professional. Here's ho- here we're making Hollywood. Well, cuts. <laughs> well, that's what I know that there are some movies studi- that are made. I, I know that some mov- some movie studios use Premiere Pro, but uh, if you're looking at the, at like the enterprise movie space, it's not just Premiere Pro in there. Yes. <laughs> well, m- most uh, most will use something like Adobe or DaVinci Resolve or something like that. But for me, the Premiere Pro is what I learned to edit with and what I've used for the most part of my video editing history. So it makes sense for me to keep using it because anything else feels just too uh, how to say this too basic or unrefined too unrefined yeah oh, too okay. unrefined okay yeah that's that's like the number one argument that i hear about any adobe user looking at all these alternative tools is that uh it's got all the features that i'm looking for it's just like uh but 
The keybinds don't match. The buttons are in diff- are in weird places and all that. User stuff. experience is just. Yep. I can't. I like. I can tell you a story. I when I was uh, when I was doing some more professional video editing. I for for fun and for like interest, I put three computers side by side: a Linux computer running Caden Live, a Windows computer running Premiere Pro, and a Windows computer running DaVinci Resolve. And I went and I tried to edit the same video on all three. Just out of interest, I was a short clip, nothing special. And back then, it was a couple of years ago. It wasn't like it wasn't like just short clip. It was I had three three clips. They had to uh, just uh, weave between each each other for like I had ten minute ten minute run. And let me tell you, Caden Life at the time couldn't even do multicam. Now they can. Now it can, I believe. Yeah, it can. But at the time it couldn't, and that was just oh, how much work was that compared to Premiere Pro and DaVinci. But I'm gonna say, like DaVinci Resolve can do really well, and if if you are on Linux and want to use Caden Live, DaVinci Resolve works really well. Except it ha- on 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 free version, it has few issues like. You cannot uh, save into uh, MP4. You have to save to some oddball format and then MOV. transcode. Yeah. yeah, and then transcode to to MP4. But otherwise, works really well. But for me, it isn't a good NLE for me because honestly, I find it it is NLE second because it has one of the best uh, color grading tools there is. It's actually the best color grading tool, tool, in my opinion. I'm not good at color grading, so don't expect much from me, but I can do it if I really need to. But compared, but video editing compared to uh, Premiere Pro is just a tad bit lesser. But then again, there are some professional students that swear by video editing of DaVinci Resolve, so who am I to say? <laughs> I have heard a guy where he says that he does all the all the timeline editing in Adobe, and then he renders out the video to this insanely high format, and then he imports it into DaVinci Resolve just so he can color grade it. Yeah, th- that's what people do. Yeah, yeah color grading. Uh, DaVinci Resolve ha- is the best color grading tool there is currently. Yeah, at least and, at least on my, in my experience. Yeah, and uh, the only real issue that I have with DaVinci Resolve is that they're targeting specifically uh, Rel Eight or that Rel yes. Eight ecosystem. Uh, yes. So they're so uh, they're hard checking for libraries that are that are in slash user user share or uh, in slash user bin. Uh, they're checking for yeah. very specific versions that they don't really have to be checking for. Uh, and then it it gets a little awkward sometimes. I mean, yes, uh, if you're using Arch Linux, there's an AUR script that'll uh, sit there and, and load up DaVinci Resolve for you. And then I think that there's even Ubuntu PPA that you can use. And I believe there is also a container you can use with DistroBox. Yeah, there there is a uh, there there's a DistroBox container that you can use called DaVinci Box. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can do that. Uh, I think that there's there there might even be like a flat pack manifest file that you can use that so that you can be, manually build a flat pack too. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's been published onto Flat Hub though. Well, uh, what that, about other tools beyond just video editing? There is other stuff you need to do well, when you're course, content creation. Because you know, uh, where Linux is fairly weak in like the video editing workflow experience, it has fantastic audio editing tools. Yeah, because uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this thing, Big Pod, but it's called Audacity. I have. Uh, if uh, now if you're a podcaster and you want to learn how to podcast and you don't want to pay for like any of the big software like the Reaper, the Ableton Studio, or anything like that, you probably mess around with Audacity. But if you're like the old school podcaster, we're talking about like ten years ago, Audacity was the only option. And if you're if we're talking about even before that, and you're doing like professional audio engineering, you probably did use Audacity. 
Yeah. Because the one the one thing that Audacity has going for it, and it is quite famous for, is that noise reduction tool that that it has. It is so good at at the noise reduction that uh, a lot of uh, these proprietary applications. Uh, I don't know what the Adobe one is called. Uh, uh, it's called, and I forget. I, I probably for... I could look. I could look. Yeah, it, it, it's called Audition, isn't it? Yeah, Adobe yeah. Audition. Yeah. Yeah, they they literally have their own fork of of, of the Audacity uh, no, noise reduction mm. plugin. That, yeah, that, I believe uh, so. Yeah, that they run, <laughs> and yeah. a, a couple of these other options actually use that as well. And if you're just uh, if you're just editing like voice, Audacity is still very good for that. Yeah. Uh, you can't do anything like make a music track with Audacity. I mean, you can, but it's secretly a pain in the butt. But yeah. uh, Audacity, gold standard, in in my opinion, for uh, audio ed- editing. Now, is it the best? No, but it's pretty damn good. I actually learned how to audio edit on Audacity. Yeah, same here. Uh, and the only reason I learned how to audio edit on Audacity was because of a record project that I had where I wanted to digitize records and I used Audacity to clean up a lot of the uh, noise static from from because you know I'm dealing with like these 30 plus year old records so of course they're a little scratchy yeah and I used Audacity a lot <laughs> to you know clean clean up some of that stuff but well, uh, if if you need a more professional tool there are other options and if you want to stick to free and open source Ardor is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that there is a YouTube channel called Unfa, U-N-F-A. Uh, he he makes all of his music using just Ardor. And he has he does tutorials for, for uh, Ardor, Ardor and everything. And uh, if he, he makes a lot of EDM uh, da- dance beat music with it. And he it seems to be pretty good for that. I haven't messed around with Ardor myself, uh, uh, to be honest with you. But Me neither. I have messed around a little bit with Reaper, which uh, it's it's a fairly new application that's coming around in like the podcasting space, uh, and uh, it's like a fifty dollar one time payment for it, which I'm fine with. It's not like a yearly su- subscription or anything. <laughs> yeah, which. That's that's right up my jam right there because you know yeah. fifty dollar one time payment get 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 something that I can uh, re- record and and edit guess who's with? paying the subscription? Yeah, 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 Mister Mister Creative Cloud here. Yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, you know, fantastic tool. I have messed around with it when uh, messed around with recording recording with it when I was uh, on the Linux cast, and. Uh, it worked relatively well for just a basic record and export. And yeah. I'm gonna be bit honesty here. For our podcast, it's produced on on proprietary tools. Uh, yeah, it is. Audition, Premiere Pro. Yep. Mainly because, uh, well, I, I I'm using Premiere Pro, so why not use Audition? Because it's in the same package. That's true. That's true. Okay. So uh, now that we know how to edit our videos and our audio, how about just a basic picture? Yep. We need a thumbnail uh, after all. Yeah. You, well, I mean, we're posting these on YouTube. Somebody's got to make a clip, although we don't do a very good job of that. <laughs> so uh, the de facto standard for that is GIMP. Uh, yeah. The GNU Image Manipulation Project. That's what it stands for. Although it, it could use a coat of good user experience, let's be it, honest. It could use a coat of good user experience. Uh, I don't hit any of the buttons myself. I know a lot of the key bindings for GIMP, and that's how I use it. <laughs> or, yeah. uh, or you know, I I figured out the, like the the uh, run menu for GIMP, and that's what I typically use too. But and realistically, but, most users unless they are like professional or really well versed, will want to hit, hit buttons on screen. And that's where uh, GIMP just loses it compared to many other yeah. tools in the but professional you know, sphere. Uh, there, there's GIMP plugins like Photo GIMP that moves yeah. all the buttons around for you and makes it work work just like an older version of Photoshop. Uh, that said, the one the one part where GIMP fails is, is it's a great image 
manip manipulation tool. That's in its name. But it is not a great tool for editing a photo. There are better options for that. Yeah. And uh, one, one of the big ones right now, Krita. It, it is a KDE project. It get a and it is completely fully funded. It, it I think of all the KDE applications, Krita is actually the most well funded, well funded of all the applications. Yeah, and it's actually because, kind of an industry industry well known player. Yeah, from what uh, I know. If you if you're watching 3D artists and they're not using Adobe, they're probably using Krita. Yeah, and uh, it is a and yes, you it is a drawing program. Yes. But it is an amazing editor for photos that you would take with the camera. And because uh, it, it is a non-destructive editor. That's which basically mean, big which thing. Which means, yeah, that is a big thing. And, of course, if you're want if you messing around with, like, film camera editing that you, that you want to digitize and all that, Darktable is also an option. Yeah. Of, of which, oftentimes, because, you know, uh, the camera that I use for, like, recording my video... Is the same camera that I use for take taking photos with family and friends, and uh, the, the Canon RAW format can only be read by Darktable. <laughs> so uh, what I have to do is uh, is I have to open up Darktable, uh, import the photos into that, and then re-export them back out into uh, SVGs or PNGs. That way I can mess around with them in GIMP or Krita. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's a RAW format thing that happens yeah. many times. Yeah. So uh, I I just wanted to uh, th throw that out there. I I don't do anything complicated with Darktable because I just don't care to do anything complicated with Darktable. But I know it can do some very very uh, amazing things with like brightness control, satur saturation handling, and, yeah. and composition. If it can do, if it can uh, work on raw photos, it can do some really really complex things because raw really what it does it. Uh, gets the whole specter in and anything and many things that could be changed within settings of the camera uh, before the taking of picture can still be changed after the picture is taken. Yep. Which is really impressive to me. And I know how it works, but it's still really impressive <laughs> <laughs> what we can do with digital photos. Yep. And uh, now that we're done talking about digital photos, you want to get super fancy. You want to get those 3D effects going and all that stuff, yes. right? Yeah, you want to get animations and models. Yeah, anim animations, models. You want to be able to see. You want to be able to activate the desktop cube and rotate the camera between me and Big Pod whenever, just to do a transition. You got to do that in Blender. In the standard. Uh, yep. Now it is that is an industry it, standard we can talk it, about. It is. The true industry standard. Yeah. Because uh, I believe, I might be wrong with this, but I think even Pixar is messing around with Blender these days. I believe so. A lot of, <laughs> at least to a partially, you they use, some studios use Blender. And sure, there are things like Maya and After Effects, but wow, the, but Blender stands right beside them. The standard it stands right beside them. It might not have the plugins for for it, or it might yeah. not have the marketplace that you know Maya has, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good option. <laughs> yeah, it's... that and uh, Blender can do everything. All of these previous tools that we discussed yeah. can do because you know it does have a video editor in, built into it. <laughs> yeah, it even has a game engine plugin you can put into. It. You can make video games with Blender. <laughs> so uh, if you're a Blender guy. And uh, you want to get into the video editing? Just use the Blender video editor. Oh, you wanted to make a video game too? Might as well just use Blender for that. I mean, heaven forbid, you're, if you were making a video game on a Linux and you want to be able to port it onto Linux, you're probably using Blender to draw the models anyway. <laughs> but uh, now, uh, let's talk about how we record other things. You know, like if if we, you know we don't want to mess around with uh the these uh editing applications and we just want to do just a basic recording uh when it comes to camera recording there are realistically two options uh on linux we we have this driver package called v4l2 
Uh, that is the video driver for Linux. It, is, it stands for video for Linux. And uh, that is the that is the kernel module that implements all of the video fe feeds. So like our, uh, my camera is being fed through V4L. And uh, there is a graphical program that interacts directly with that called GovCVO. And uh, that is, it's, it's an old school tool. So it looks a little terrible. But what the way that but GovC view will open up every single option in that kernel driver for you. And if you didn't realize just how much your camera can do, I highly recommend that you just install GovC view and just look at all the options that are pre presented for you. Like uh, if you're still using like the that good old Logitech uh, C720 camera that you know uh, they they produce for like 14 plus years and they don't even support themselves anymore but they still sell it, <laughs> GovCVU yeah. can get you a 1080p stream at 60 fps with that camera. Yeah. <laughs> Just letting you know, it can even do 4K at 30. <laughs> And uh, you can mess around with saturation controls. You can take individual pictures. You can record videos with it, too. But uh, if you need something that's a little simpler, and or say you want to be able to use a newer camera uh, that maybe V4L doesn't support yet, but you know that there is support for, like, the new, for, like, the new libraries called, that's called LibCamera, uh, Gnome's Cheese application, actually also pretty decent. Yeah. Now... You gotta remember, both these programs are not video editors. They they are just recording, but yeah. uh, they can record. And uh, their goal is to record the video feed and take a picture every now and then. And yeah. both those applications do that perfectly fine. But uh, let's talk about the screen now. Now, uh, of course, when we're talking about uh, recording a screen, there is one overarching application that we will touch in on the next next miniature segment in this because you know it kind of just does everything but uh, let's just look at just screen recording and there is nothing more more uh, self-describing and simplistic than simple screen recorder yeah uh the issue with simple screen recorder is that it does not support wayland but if you're on x11 and you want to just be able to open up an application and hit record and have your screen right away simple screen recorder yeah it will just it work. is it is installed and go. Uh, the, it does have some options with it. I've never had to use the options with it because it's just open and hit record. <laughs> but it, it it's like that. But it doesn't support like hardware acceleration like, uh, you know, GPU screen recorder has. But, you know, it's in the name. It's GPU re screen recorder. Uh, it works best with NVIDIA cards because uh, it it uh, uses the, the NVIDIA Shadow Play library. So... Uh, protocols but uh, it can do the same thing with uh, AMD GPUs I don't know how well it supports Intel GPUs because you know they're still fairly new yeah uh, and uh, that works f it it works amazingly well for like capturing uh, like video games because you know that's basically what Shadow plays for anyway yeah and then if you're just wanting if you happen to be on Wayland and you just want to record your screen on, on a Wayland session it's called Kuha, K O O H A, and it is just like Simple Screen Recorder. You launch it, you hit record, it records a video. It just drops it right in, right in your root home, home folder of your home directory. And uh, of course, Big Pod. <laughs> there is one application that we've been failing to mention that I guarantee you, twenty plus people are, have been screaming at us the, this entire time. Do you know what that one is? Yeah, Open Broadcast Studio. Okay, I'm glad I don't OBS have to explain it Studio. to you. Yeah, uh, if you want the application that does everything, it's OBS Studio. Yeah, <laughs> Open Broadcaster Software Studio. It's... Yep, because... Uh... Well, it's, it just is. Yeah, I mean, if, can... if, you're, stream if you're streaming on Twitch... You're you've probably OBS. used OBS. Yeah, yeah, you've probably used OBS or using something that's a fork of OBS. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably not using the XSplit like people used to use. Yeah, that's yeah, that was a thing back when. But yeah, now it's I think, still, I think people, people still use. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think people are still are coming back around to Xbox because uh, they've been yeah. implementing some nice features. Yeah. But you know, OBS Studio let you uh, stream in 1080p, where Xbox you had to pay a subscription for. <laughs> yeah. Although that might be different nowadays. But uh, OBS Studio, the one application that can record and stream it. Stream and broadcast everything for you. It can even do some like uh, li live uh, effects for you as well. So like uh, you can step up like your your co contrast with your video feed and be able to uh, add some filters on your audio. So like uh, noise gates, a uh, sound compression, and so on. Uh, it's actually what uh, and uh, in in my case, it's actually what I'm using to uh, not only record a local copy of my own video feed with audio that that way I could send off to our editor, which is Big Pod, but uh, it's also like passing. It's also capturing my camera and passing it through uh, the V4L2 loopback module to uh, this to uh, this uh, bro browser browser system that we're using to to uh, capture to uh, you know be able to see each other's video feed. Yeah. And uh, it it does a lot of really cool stuff. And yeah, it is a it is like the name suggests it is a broadcast studio. Yeah, is it isn't as professional as something? What's that thing called? That is that is very used by more professional. Uh, of course, there, there is hardware solutions that are in in its highest level. But for OBS, like professional OBS alternatives, if I could remember the name of the of the one that is like professional, but I won't remember it out of my head. Oh, well, let's uh, let's uh, do a quick Google search here: professional streaming applications. Uh, not for mobile broadcasting because we're not looking to do that. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Scroll, 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 scroll. This is broadcast protocols. These are broadcast platforms. That's not what I'm looking for. VMix. I was thinking of VMix. Yeah, VMix. Okay. Which is yeah. what I use at a, at a semi-professional level. But for for most things, this, the studio that is OBS works quite well. You can assign everything from transitions, many scenes, uh, and very, very well mixing of different microphones and other audio inputs. You have a lot of filters, including some actually professional filtering capabilities. I think it even so supports on. some VST plugins too, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you want to see what... Uh, what OBS is truly capable of. There is only one YouTube channel that I can really point you to, and that is Epos Vox. Yeah. Uh, his OBS Masterclass is a fantastic getting started guide for OBS Studio. Uh, he he mostly broadcasts using Windows, so uh, there there are some uh, Linux specific things you might have to do, but in general, uh, it is. A fantastic resource and of course if you're going to be using OBS Studio on Linux uh, there's several different packages you can use there's a snap package that's available uh, in this in the snap store uh, that basically comes and ships with like 30 built-in plugins immediately I don't think it actually does that anymore I believe that was uh, more changed to be more upstream yeah maybe more like upstream uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, basically a git repository that does exactly the same thing just it's basically a portable version of it and there was then built a container for it so yeah. you can use it with your uh, distrobox container yeah that's uh the obs fully loaded project if i remember right yes that's that yeah that's uh maintained by a uh, big a uh, big friend of big pods uh martin Wimpress. yeah and uh hit and his computer and his community from uh, Wimpy's World, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you've got the flat pack for available for OBS City, which is officially maintained by the OBS project. Yeah. And uh, they've and uh, a lot of the plugin authors also publish their applications as a flat pack plugin for it as well. 
So if you're using something like GNOME Software or uh, KDE, there's a there's there's actually a plugins button that you can click on, and you can see all the available plugins. Which, uh, that is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, because you know it turns out that when you're on Linux, not all the uh, plugins are compiled for your distribution, so you might need to uh, recompile OBS with the plugins, or yeah. uh, have or you know. Uh, pull down the OBS source code. That way you can you, that way you can compile the plugins, or you you just need to figure out how to manually install the plugins. You But a lot that. of that is solved by Flatpak plugins because yeah, oh. well, it works anywhere. Yeah, it it just works. Uh, yeah. That said, I have had some issues with it. Sometimes not right re- with the uh, Flatpak, uh, where it just or like the sandboxing just doesn't seem to let it seems to not identify with my hardware sometimes. I don't know why what's going on with that. <laughs> I so don't I'll... use any plugins, but I've been using Flatpak for what year and a half now. Yeah. Uh that said, I've got a lot of stuff I'm trying to load into OBS too. Uh because you know, I have a lot of automate I uh, I I make use of a lot of automation scripts with it. I don't. Yeah. All I do is just just do a completely clean raw stream unless I'm streaming <laughs> and then edit edit with uh, my preferred editing tool yeah but anyways uh, that's generally the tools that you can make use of for like making some content content for Linux uh, th- th- I know that there's a I know that there's a lot of people that just like post a bunch of stuff about Linux on YouTube But you know, you can do more than just distribution reviews. Yeah. That'd be that'd be great because you know, uh, checking out the latest and greatest Ubuntu releases is great and all. But uh, I personally find no joy in like making a video that is just a review of a Linux distro. Yeah, same. Uh, That's why I don't have a lot of videos because yeah, that kind uh, of content doesn't interest me. Yeah, but you know, uh. If you can come up with something informative that uh, nobody else has, you could probably hit the road running. Like uh, my, I posted a video like uh, I think it's almost a year or two ago about like the general workflow of the 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 g- general default workflow of GNOME. That continues to be one of my most popular videos on my YouTube channel because you know all I did was just uh, install. I think it was a Red Hat release that I that I recorded the video on. I had Bunstock GNOME, and I showed people how to how how uh, GNOME's human inter- interface guidelines expect you to use GNOME. <laughs> yeah, and that 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 uh, small videos like that, uh, while they don't get like the views immediately that like a distribution review would get, there are people that will find value in that kind of stuff. And uh, YouTube is a great platform to be posting that stuff onto. But uh, you can also just like do the blog thing too, which there are thousands of ways you can make you can spin up a blog. I mean, after all, uh, Linux is the standard for web hosting. Yeah. But uh, Big Pod, we got some feedback. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is from a. Uh, this is from an. An individual listener. I'm just going to call him Derek. I'm not going to say his full name, but uh, he says that it's a great show, and Thanks. he thinks that uh, yeah. It and I'm glad that he says that's a great show. I because you know the last guy certainly didn't say anything about the show being great. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he didn't say that it was a bad show either. <laughs> but uh, he he wanted to point out an issue that we had with our audio levels. And uh, I I uh, spoke with my editor about it, and uh, hopefully this episode comes out a little bit better than than the last few. Yeah, hopefully. And, uh, yep. And uh, he said that he really liked the take that we had on VPNs, and I'm glad uh, that uh, somebody found value in that in, in that subject too. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm getting sick and tired of the Norse VPNs. Yeah. Yeah. I. So, uh, thanks, thanks, Derek. Uh, just, just a reminder: you can always give us a shout by sending us an email to contact at tuckspace That will, uh, if you send an email to that, that will forward out, forward that out to all of our hosts, 
uh, myself, Big Pod, and sometimes even Steve. And uh, you you can always send, you can always give us a shout. And of course, we're always looking. We're trying to find like a way to fund the this show because we do this wonderful thing that a lot of podcasters don't do. We self-host our own podcast instance. And, of yeah. course, self-hosting is not free. Not cheap. <laughs> it is not free. Uh, I forgot I, the labor. Just, the, just yeah. the hardware of it and and all that can be pretty pricey. Bandwidth and all, storage and all that. I mean, our, our number one cost right now is actually... Uh, our number one cost is potentially bandwidth, not necessarily not necessarily the storage, but the bandwidth of distributing yeah. the episodes. Because you got to remember, when we publish an episode, we publish it onto our little dinky uh, dinky VPS server that uh, puts it onto a uh, S3 bucket that gets shared shared out through all of these other indexes. So when you go to iTunes, how does iTunes get that episode to serve you? It pulls it from us. And uh, hopefully they have their own cache of it. But uh, just last Please. month, just last month, uh, we our viewership is still relatively small, and uh, yeah. we uh, the traffic for our entire podcast already took up two gigs, uh, gigabytes, not gigabits, gigabytes of traffic. Yeah. Now, uh, on average, the the MP3 file that uh, we post up onto the RSS feed is on average about thirty six to forty megabytes of of size, and uh, that's a lot of files being served. Uh, let me correct you there. In monthly bandwidth, we serve ten gigabytes, not two. Okay, well, it has grown exponentially since I last checked. Uh, the April. <laughs> was about two, uh, 10 and a half gigabytes of bandwidth used. Yeah. Now, we're still in our free bandwidth tier. Yeah. But the the more the the, the bigger that this podcast gets, uh I might be getting some angry emails from a VPS provider telling me that hey, uh you're you're getting a lot of traffic through here. We need you to pay up, Mr. Mr. Josh. <laughs> yeah. So, uh if you have ideas for how we can monetize the show, don't be afraid to send us an email and tell us how you want to give us money. Yeah. Uh, I am not 100% opposed to the merch thing, but I have opinions <laughs> on how merch can be handled. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, uh, and I, and you know, I don't want to be going through like these third party stores or anything like that. And, you know, not be able to get that merch and not be able to see that merch for myself to see if it's any good. Because you know, Same. Teespring is great and all, but you know they were literally print, printing uh, the the shirts onto the cheapest possible thing, and we have a very international audience as well. So uh, yeah, I know we get a lot of viewership in Europe, a lot of viewership in the United States. We even get some viewership out out in like uh, I think I think I've seen some downloads coming from New Zealand. Yeah, <laughs> and New Zealand, Australia, and Asia. So we're really an international podcast. Yes, and uh, you know, if you want to tell us about it, engagement challenge here. If you're watching on YouTube, or if you're watching this through the RSS feed, send us some com, send us some feedback and tell us where you're from. Uh, I I'm I'm just genuinely curious. Yeah. But of course, uh, if you want to, if you don't want to shout out the show in general, you can shout at us directly, Big Pod. Do you know how? Uh, you can check us out on Mastodon. All three of us have a Mastodon accounts uh, on different servers. Uh, they should appear in the descriptions or show notes, or if you're watching on YouTube, on the screen. You, oh, you mean like right now? Yeah, right now. They, they, oh, they are oh. already on the screen. Oh, wow. It's almost like uh, we pre we uh, pre planned this and, uh, you know, made, <laughs> made like this whole uh, transition scene here for us ahead of time and everything. It's, it's like I made an animation for it. Or that, or that, man, that editing magic, the wonderful, <laughs> the wonderful beauty of media. But anyways, guys, uh, I think that's all we got here for today. So we'll go ahead and see you next time.